When you have a plant that starts going south, it is go time in figuring out, have you overwatered, underwatered? Is it a lighting problem? Is it a fungal disease? There is a myriad of different problems that can be occurring with our plants. And let me tell you, plant friends, it's not easy to decipher sometimes. And when you're a hobbyist, there's a lot of plant care advice on the internet, on a care card, at a garden center, maybe even garden lore that you've heard that can get you by. But sometimes you need to call on the big gun. Sometimes you need to really understand some science in order to resuscitate and bring your plant back to life and make sure that it continues to thrive. When you learn the science behind plant care, it helps you grow a deeper and better understanding of why your plants are thriving or not thriving and how to ensure that it doesn't happen again. We don't just want to remedy the immediate issue. We want to understand why it happened so that we could prevent it from happening in the future. And that's where a general understanding of plant science comes in, but it can be really intimidating. And that's where my plant nerd bestie, Leslie Hallett, comes in. She's a certified horticulturist with decades of experience in all things plants, and she's who I call to troubleshoot my own plant problems. So I figured if I get to call her for my plant stuff, I should also maybe invite her onto the podcast and start a series (laughs) so that she can answer your questions too. So we're welcoming Leslie Halleck back to the podcast for a series we're calling Grow Better, where we dive into scientific whys behind plant care and all to help you grow better plants live happier lives, and avoid common mistakes that we all make because you don't know what you don't know, and we're here to help you know that. Does that make sense? All right. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. I know I have nestled in the woods. It's been such a beautiful spring into summer. I am so excited to have my dear friend, Leslie Halleck, back on the podcast. If you've been around here for a while, if you've been a listener for a while, you know Leslie. She has been a repeat guest on the podcast. She's my dear friend. She's the former horticulturist in residence of a premium tier of the Garden Society app, which is currently closed. She's the best. She's a super nerd. She's a super plant nerd. She's an author. And I think she's one of the best plant science teachers out there, certainly from who I've learned from. You know, everyone hits a moment in our plant parenthood where you start looking at care cards, you start looking at general advice and saying, okay, I can get on board with this, but why? I know a plant needs bright light, but why? I know I'm supposed to let a succulent soil dry out, but why? I know I need fertilizer, but why? And often the why includes an intense plant science exploration of photosynthesis, relative humidity, transpiration, And even just hearing those words can send hobbyists into a spiral. But Leslie is so good at meeting our enthusiastic hobbyist community where we're at and walking us through the science. And, you know, I've gotten to know this community pretty well after making this podcast for six years. And there's definitely a bunch of common mistakes that I've made myself that I know many people in this community have made. And a little bit of plant science knowledge really will help you understand overwatering versus underwatering. What is bright and direct light? Why do plants take a turn for the worse when they come home from the nursery and more? That's what we're going to be addressing in today's episode, Common Mistakes Plant Parents Make. And Leslie will join me for a new series we're introducing on the show called Grow Better, where Leslie and I will explore different aspects of plant parenthood and some science that will help you understand and support you better to have your plants thrive to their fullest, most beautiful versions of themselves. And you too. I'm so excited that I get to share my best plant friend with you, Leslie. And speaking of plant friendship, I wanted to also welcome three new plant friends to the Growing Joy Garden Society, James G., Kathy C., and Denise C. Welcome, plant friends. Thank you so much for joining the Garden Society platform and app. If you don't know what the Garden Society is, it's a platform and app, iOS, Android, and your computer. It's a community for my international group of listeners that love this show. The objective of the app is to make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow more joy in your life. It has different 
different conversation topics about houseplants, gardening, planty DIY, plantrepreneurship, whatever you want, we've got it. There are mini courses in there. It's a very special place. I call it the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. And if you listen to the show, it's a wonderful way to support the podcast. The membership there helps support our editors and producers and podcast managers. So thank you in advance. If you want to join, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. So once again, jointhegardensociety.com. Welcome, Denise, Kathy, and James. Can't wait to get to know you better in the platform. All right. Leslie and I take a bunch of big questions and misunderstandings and confusion head on in this episode. I could have easily talked to her for 90 minutes. I had to cut us off at the 60 minute mark. So let's dive right in. Leslie, welcome back. I am embarrassed how long it's been since you've been back on the show. I think you don't love me anymore, Maria. Absolutely not. (laughs) It's just that I get to talk to you offline and then sometimes I forget it's been so long since you've actually been having a public conversation with me. But you're my big guns I brought in for today's conversation, Leslie, because I feel like this is a commonly requested topic that I feel like is hard to find a guest for because it's such a large span of issues and an enthusiast like me is going to struggle. So we're bringing in the big guns, Leslie Halleck, everyone. (laughs) Hi, hi. I'm so happy to be back. Yes, we do spend a lot of time together offline and I stay pretty darn busy. So I'll let you off the hook. Yes. Now, since you've been back, since the last time you've been here, we've gotten a bunch of new listeners. We've rebranded to Growing Joy with Plants. So if you're a first-time listener and this is the first time you've heard the beautiful voice of my dear friend, Leslie Halleck, you're welcome. This next hour is about to blow your mind. But Leslie, for those who might not know who you are, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself before we dive in? Oh, boy. Okay. Leslie Halleck. I'm a lifelong plant nerd. We'll just start with that. I'm a professional horticulturist, degreed and credentialed. I've worked in the green industry for 30 years and researched public gardens, garden centers, landscaping. In the last 10 years, I've run my own consulting agency within the green industry, working with businesses and consumers and writing books. I write plant books. Like a whole bunch of books. Yeah. For plant books for gardening and houseplant enthusiasts, anybody interested in nerding out on specialty plant topics. So yeah, I mean, that's, you know, anybody who's really interested in all the details can go to my website and read my bio if you want to do that, or I'm sure you'll put up some information, you know, on your blog, but uh, yeah, that's the short of it. Yes. And you are a horticulturist in residence in the Garden Society, which we did in 2022. But you are my best plant friend and you're also my best plant resource because you have (laughs) had such a wide variety of knowledge. And um, our community loves your books, Plant Parenthood for Propagation, Gardening Under Lights. But today I want to talk to you about kind of a dark side of Plant Parenthood when plants don't look the way they look on Instagram. Yes. I will say that one of the phenomenons that has manifested from social media and the visibility of everyone sharing everything they love and that sort of morphing into the need to show everything perfectly, right? To sort of present oneself and one's life and even one's plants as being beautiful and perfect, when in reality, we know that that's not the case, has sort of created, I think, a lot of expectations and anxiety for plant parents and gardeners to live up to what they're seeing on social media. It's created a lot of opportunities for people to share their plant passions, but I think that it generates a lot of what I call green guilt. You know, that's one of my favorite terms. And what I love doing is absolving green guilt for people because I think that there's sort of this expectation that you're going to buy a plant, you're going to bring it home, and it's going to look beautiful and perfect forever, just like it did in the pictures that you saw online or on someone else's feed. And as you well know, that can change very quickly. And that causes a lot of stress and anxiety. And oftentimes, especially beginners, don't really know what to do in that situation or what steps they should take to either stop the decline of a plant or maybe know when to throw in the towel 
right? I, I think that that's really hard for most gardeners and, and plant enthusiasts is to, you know, when to pitch that plant in the compost pile. <laughs> so, you know, there's sort of ways to observe and prevent. There's things you can do when you're in the middle of a problem, potentially. And then there's a point at which you need to know when to jump ship. And I think all of those things are very challenging for most plant enthusiasts and gardeners. Yeah. And I think, so let's kick off this conversation by saying, if you are listening to this episode because you have killed a plant or because you have brought a plant home and it's gone downhill, you are still so worthy of plant parenthood. It is so normal. (laughs) It is not shared about online, but we have all gone through this. And Leslie, one of my favorite things that you say over and over again is you're a horticulturist and you still lose plants. Like this is part of the journey. All plant, like it's so normal for a plant to transition out of the nursery and go through a little hiccup or, you know, our plants are living things that get sick, just like we as humans are living things that get sick. And it's okay. Like this episode is going to help support you in those moments, but also don't be fooled by the shiny Instagram accounts. This is part of your plant parenthood journey. So fear not. One of the things I think that we forget as humans is that we have far less control over things than we like to think we do. We sort of live in this, <laughs> you know, state of thinking we can control things. And plants are often very good teachers for us in reminding us that we don't always have as much control as we think we do. And even us professional plant scientists, horticulturists, growers, We all kill plants. And I always tell all of my students, you know, I've I've killed way more plants than all of you combined ever will. You'll never catch up with me. This is how we learn. We learn how to grow something successfully by having a quote unquote failure. And we learn from that opportunity. And that's how we grow it better the next time. A hundred percent. So you already mentioned something that I think I have had so many members of my community reach out with very anxious DMs. You go to a garden center, you see a bevy of plants that are in perfect condition, you bring that plant home, and then all of a sudden it doesn't look like the way it looked at the garden center or at the plant shop. So can you kind of explain the journey that a plant is going from, going from a greenhouse to your home condition and why a plant might take a minute to adjust to your home, what's normal and what isn't? Yes. So the thing to remember is that when you're buying that house plant at a plant shop or a garden center, ideally it hasn't been there for very long, right? Hopefully it's relatively fresh stock, but remembering that before it arrived at that plant shop or garden center, it was being grown by primarily professional growers under the ideal growing conditions for that plant, light, water, humidity right? Those are sort of the main three things that are going to impact the look of that plant. When you buy that plant and you take it home, what kind of environmental conditions do you think you have versus the very ideal growing conditions that was provided before it arrived at that garden center? Very different. Normally, the biggest adjustment that a plant is going to have to make to personify the plant is the change in light conditions. You know me, I harp on light. Light's the number one input as far as I'm concerned. And it's the biggest determining factor in whether or not your plant is going to be happy and succeed to your expectations. So normally that plant is going from an area where it is receiving a much larger quantity of light. And then you take it home and put it in your living room or your office or your kitchen. And it's very easy to think right? Using your human eyeballs that you have a bright space. But we learn that what looks bright to our human eyes does not always translate into light quantity for plants. So usually the first adjustment that that plant has to make is going from a relatively high level of light to a relatively low level of light, which is what most of us have indoors. Most of us have low light indoors. And For many tropical plants, think ficus, right? That's not a happy transition. And so very quickly in the first couple of weeks, you'll notice changes to that plant. So typically light is going to be the biggest shift in environmental conditions that that plant has and is usually going to be the number one input that's going to influence what direction that plant goes. And then of course, the light 
the amount of light, lack thereof, is going to influence the plant's ability to use the other input. So you take it home, you put it in what you think is that relatively bright living room, and then you start watering it every week because that's what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to water it every week. And then what happens? The plant stays wet because the light is lower. Photosynthesis rate goes down. That plant stays wet. You start to have root suffocation. And now you're in a situation where you maybe are overwatering that plant, right? So humidity levels would be the next thing. Generally, that plant has been grown under higher humidity levels than you have in your home. You take it, you put it into your house with lower light levels, low relative humidity, and you're watering it a lot at the root zone. And now we have a recipe for problems right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. Oh my God. You just said, I'm like, and there's our episode on how to diagnose plant (laughs) issues. Hi, everyone. (laughs) Okay. So you're bringing up so many things. The environment a plant is in, in a greenhouse is so different than your home and your home is not the ideal environment. I mean, if you want to talk about humidity in the winter, my home in the woods in New York is 17% humidity. And in a greenhouse, it can be 80% humidity. So think about that transition, right? That a plant is going to go through. So I guess that's not diagnosing a plant problem, but that's kind of giving a advisory to people when you bring your plants home, don't get too nervous if your plant starts to look a little different. But you mentioned something, Leslie, that I think people view separately, but actually are very intertwined. And I think once you understand that watering and light are intertwined and have to work together instead of separately, that can heal a lot of issues, especially with overwatering and underwatering. Because I feel like obviously lighting is the biggest reason why plants go downhill, but I think overwatering and underwatering is a hugely confusing thing for people. It's hard to diagnose because some of the symptoms look the same. And I think figuring out watering is really tricky for plant parents. So can you speak a little bit to why watering and light play together? You had touched upon it, but can you kind of go a little further? Yes. So One of the biggest misconceptions I think most plant parents have about managing water, because everyone has been fed the line that most people kill their houseplants from overwatering, right? How many times have you heard that? How many times have you read that, right? So that's the number one killer of houseplants is overwatering. Well, that's really not true. As a professional, I'm going to tell you the number one killer of your houseplants is under lighting. You end up watering that plant too much because the plant isn't getting enough light and it cannot handle the amount of water that you're providing any longer because the rate of photosynthesis has dropped to a level. Because the plant is using the water as part of the photosynthesis. So the water and the light are working together, right, Leslie? Science? Correct, right. So water is part of the chemical equation of photosynthesis and through photosynthesis, water molecules are broken up and that oxygen that your plant releases out into the atmosphere actually comes from the broken water molecules, not carbon dioxide. So water plays a crucial part, obviously, in turgidity and nutrient movement and, of course, all of those other things through the plant, but it's also a crucial ingredient of photosynthesis. And when the rate of photosynthesis decreases, how much water that plant uses decreases, When the temperature in your home is cooler than it was in that greenhouse, evapotranspiration slows down. So the rate at which water is being pulled up and taken out of your plant also slows down. It can be increased by a low relative humidity, but right, that gets tricky. All of these things have to balance together. So let's take succulents for an example. Succulents, which are generally highlight plants, there are a few exceptions, but generally speaking, most succulents are going to be happy with at least several hours a day of what we would consider direct sunlight, right? Which is very intense compared to what we have indoors. So you take that beautiful Echeveria that you've bought and you take it and you put it in your living room and you keep watering it on the same schedule that you were told to water it, right? At the garden center or wherever, or whatever you've read online. And, you know, within a few weeks, right, you start to see lower leaves dropping, things start to get mushy, that plant just topples over. 
if you had put a grow light over that etch of area and provided a relatively equivalent amount of light to either what it was getting before or what it needs ideally, and you watered it on that same schedule, chances are you would no longer be overwatering that plant. That plant is going to be able to use that water. Temperatures are probably going to be a little warmer around that plant because you have a grow light over it. So that also speeds up the use of water. So learning to balance those inputs is important. So I'm always going to argue, now every home is different. Every situation is different. Are there people who legitimately overwater their plants? Of course there are. Are there situations where you have a plant that's in a container without drainage, you know, and you're obviously watering at a frequency that just isn't sustainable because of the type of container? Sure. There are times where you can legitimately overwater a plant, but for the most part, I'm suggesting that you can avoid that with adequate lighting, if that makes sense. On an episode that talks about the importance of indoor light, Plant Friends, I am so excited to be supported today by Soltech, my go-to grow light company. Soltech provides a stylish solution to give your plants all the photosynthetic rays they need to thrive. From succulents to ferns, their lights are perfect for upgrading your plant's environment and adding a touch of sunlight to any room. Their full spectrum warm white light, which is something Leslie and I talk about in today's episode, is ideal for growing houseplants and they offer a variety of options, including bulbs that you can screw into a light fixture, track lights, and their most popular American-built aspect pendant light. I liked the aspect light so much. After I got my first aspect light, I ended up getting two more. So I have three aspects and I have one of their Vita Grow bulbs as well. You can literally screw the Vita Grow bulb into any desk lamp or floor lamp that you have and it turns just a normal lamp into a grow light. It's incredible. My plants have been so happy under these lights for years, and I love that the lights look so stylish in my home as well. But don't just take my word for it. There's thousands of five-star reviews, and they have a 90-day money-back guarantee and free shipping. So if you're thinking about getting a grow light, try them out first, because that's an amazing guarantee. So visit Soltech.com today and use the code BLOOM15 for 15% off your purchase. Give your plants the lighting they deserve and upgrade your plant game with Soltech. Soltech.com and use the code BLOOM15, that's BLOOM15, for 15% off your purchase. Use the code BLOOM15 at Soltech.com today. Yeah, I like another way to think about it. If you're just like a knucklehead like me and, and all this science stuff is confusing, it's like even if you take that echeveria, like if you have two identical echeverias, one in a bright window and one in a dark area in your home and you water them at that same frequency, the one in the bright window is going to get so much more exposure to sun. They're going to photosynthesize so much more rapidly, use the water, but the other one isn't. And that's how it is so important. Like you just said, every home is different. Every home is a unique snowflake. And that's where watering schedules don't really work because if you say my watering schedule is I water every Friday, but that plant hasn't used up all that water, then you're just watering wet soil. And that's where root rot is going to go into play, right? Yes. And we'll get into sort of talking a little bit about of pest disease and diagnoses, you know, as we get a little bit further on into the conversation. But the reason I'm bringing these things up is that for most situations, the root of problems is cultural, the environment, the inputs, and how you're caring for the plant. And then that can be a foundation for the cause of a lot of other more complicated problems down the road. So your best defense to disease past nutrient deficiency issues is to get the cultural needs of that plant right as best as you can initially. And that's the best way to prevent those problems, right? So the right amount of light is obviously going to prevent a lot of issues for most plants. Your example of taking the same species and putting it in two different light situations and watering it on the same schedule is a great example. I kind of like to do that test with some of my students. I call them indicator plants. You know, if you're trying to figure out whether a location is going to provide enough light or not, take a highlight species and place it in that location and and within the first week or two, you are going to start noticing changes in that plant. That plant will tell you, it comes down to having good observational skills. You know, and everybody does want a schedule. Most people who come to me want to know, 
How often do I do this? How often do I water? How much do I water? And you know what my answer is most of the time going to be. And that's... It depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends on the temperature in your home. It depends on the relative humidity at that temperature. It depends on the light quantity in that one spot, because you, you will know you can take a plant and move it one foot back from a window and you have exponential light quantity loss. So in everybody's room and space is going to be very different from a light standpoint, because you have different size windows, different exposures, different latitudes, you name it. Any number of things are going to impact the light in your living room versus the light in my living room, right? So being very observational about the environment. And really, when you bring that plant home, one of the first things I'm going to tell you to do is really observe its quote unquote behavior. You know, we know plants aren't behaving in a certain way, but we're personifying today. So how they behave in that environment and take a few notes, watch them. If you start to notice changes in leaf color, if you start to notice leaf drops, right? That's a signal to you something is off. And usually it's going to be light is going to be the first thing that you should look at. Most people will try to change their watering schedule first, like you said, but changing the watering schedule isn't going to solve a low light problem. Mm -hmm, Totally. So we mentioned light, we mentioned watering, we mentioned cultural culprits of houseplants not, you know, thriving in a home. Are there any other culprits that you see often in your DMs and clients? For houseplants specifically? Well, I sort of mentioned humidity, but I think humidity is a really big one. I find most people don't really think about relative humidity. And when I say relative humidity, that's the humidity relative to the temperature in the room, because that's really what we're always talking about. Colder air and warmer air, the movement of water in air is different at different temperatures, right? So as temperature gets warmer, that air can hold more absolute humidity a larger absolute volume of water vapor. Colder air temperatures can hold less. So temperature plays a big part in the relative humidity of your home. And a lot of people don't consider that if they're using air conditioners, evaporative coolers, you know, those air conditioners are pulling moisture out of the air to cool it. So it can be really tough to meaningfully impact the relative humidity in your home. And for folks who are growing very humidity sensitive species, this is going to be a perpetual problem that often people try to solve by watering the plant more. And that's not going to work. What about gardeners? What about our outdoor plants? Do you feel like there's a different category of issues that they struggle with? Yes and no. So when we're bringing plants home to the garden, You can have the very same issues with light. Sometimes you're taking that plant and putting it in a place where you don't realize maybe you're getting a couple hours of really hot, direct midday sun and you actually scorch that plant because conversely, those bedding plants, annuals, perennials, whatnot may have been grown under a little bit of a shade clock. Yeah. And then you take them home and you put them in a full sun location. Now that plant may be adapted to full sun, but maybe it needs to acclimate. So on the opposite end of that light spectrum, you could end up in a situation where, ooh, you've scorched out a plant by putting it in a place that's got too much sun, right? Or conversely, you plant it in a place that's too shady. So you have similar challenges with light, but I would say outdoors, I would say the number one immediate issue is typically water, (laughs) Mm -hmm. outside because you're buying containerized plants, right? They have a limited root system. Often we take those plants and we plant them in the garden and we don't really think about how moist the soil in the garden is relative to the moisture around the root ball of that little plant that we just planted. We know that water does what? Water moves from areas of higher concentration to lower concentrations. You take that new plant that's been very babied and taken care of and has a moist root ball and you put it into soil in your garden that's relatively dry and you think, oh, it looks fine. And so you don't water it deeply enough or regularly enough after you plant it. You can lose plants very quickly within the first one to three days, just from them drying out outside very quickly. So I think water is probably a more immediate influence 
when you're bringing plants home to plant in the garden. That said, right plant, right place when it comes to light outside is just as important. So light is going to be, now that's something though you can generally mitigate a little bit easier. When you know the signs of low light or high light stress, and you can say, okay, I've maybe planted this plant in the wrong place. It's not getting enough light or it's getting too much. And you can usually move it relatively easily outdoors, right? The water issue, if they dry out within those first few days, oftentimes that's just a very quick, easy way to lose that plant altogether, right? So I think water is probably a faster, quote, plant killer for the outdoor garden when you bring home new plants, right? Yeah, water or lack of water. Correct. We got like 12 hours. So I planted up my grow bag garden a couple of weeks ago and it's been so dry, like shockingly dry up here. And then we had the weird wildfire smoke. And then last night we got like 12 hours of rain. And I was like, come on, baby. You, you know, when you get that good rain <laughs> yes. in the beginning of the summer and then your plants like double in size. I'm so excited. My plants were so happy this morning. One thing I'll say to that though, it's easy to forget So you get a good rain, it's easy to sort of get comfortable and think that, okay, I don't, I'm not going to need to water my plants for a while. And that really depends on whether you're growing small rooted annuals, whether plants are newly planted or whether you're dealing with established, you know, perennials. And so that's another thing that trips people up in the garden is that they don't really realize how fast that soil can dry back out potentially after a rain. And then they don't water again, or they don't water deeply enough. And that that's a big issue outside is not watering deeply enough, especially in areas where may, you don't get consistent, reliable rainfall. It may be intermittent or it might be feast or famine like it is for me. So soil, depending on its makeup, can dry very quickly or it can hold water and be waterlogged. So those are the other things you have to think about when you're bringing home new plants for the garden. Oh my God. And you know, my garden, I'm in felt grow bags, which dry out like when you blink an eye. Yeah. So a hundred percent, I learned my lesson last year that I've got to be helicopter plant parent with my grow bag garden. So let's talk about symptoms. What signs should people be looking for that express that the plant is moving towards its demise? You mentioned light stress. Should we start there? Sure. There's going to be a spectrum for cultural maintenance issues into actual pests and disease, right? So we can kind of start with the environment and inputs and kind of move towards the more complicated critters, right? Sure. So phytotoxicity, I'm going to throw that term out. Generally, what that means is basically any adverse effect that happens to something that's toxic to a plant. Phyto means plant. Toxicity, right? It's self-explanatory. So you can have phytotoxicity from light. You can have light damage from light that is too intense. So on the one end of things, you could have, say you have a grow light indoors and that grow light is intense, or you put the plant too close to that grow light, you might see some yellowing and scorching on those leaves from a PPFD, right? And a light intensity that's hitting that leaf that's too much for that species. Most of the time, folks are bringing home plants indoors and it's low light. So you're not going to see phytotoxicity in that situation. What you're going to see is a response to low light we call shade avoidance, whereby plants will obviously slow down in growth or even stop because, right, photosynthesis has really slowed down. Plants will start to sort of elongate or get what we call leggy and that internode length increases. And then you may have some general yellowing start to occur, right? From lack of plants will get paler and variegated plants will start to become less variegated. They'll either lose their vibrant colors or they will become more green and lose some of the pattern variegation that you see. Mm -hmm. You also have the effect of phototropism, right? Plants will start to lean towards the light, sometimes very significantly, that's a very good indicator to you that that plant is not getting enough light. When you have plants that are leaning towards the light source, (laughs) whether it's a window, right, or a grow light. So when you start to see that phototropism and plants are leaning hard towards the light, that's a pretty good indicator you've got a low light situation. You know, what breaks my heart is um, I've made this pivot into plant parenthood. My performer friends who like aren't really plant parents, maybe they have a few plants, 
will sometimes text me. And I can't tell you how many texts I've gotten that is a succulent that is so stretched because it's looking for light. But the person thinks that their plant is growing vigorously. It's growing because it's trying to look for the light. And they text me these like proud photos being like, look at how happy my plant is. It's growing so much. It's doubled in size. And then I have to like break it to them being like, oh my God, you're doing so great. But like, do you have a sunny windowsill? Maybe I bet your plant would be even happier if you could put it there. Elongated inner nodes are a cry for help. Yes. The plant may still be growing, but what's happening is that the distance between the nodes, the inner node length gets really long. And so it seems like, wow, this plant has grown a lot. But if you look at how many leaves are on that plant and how far they are apart because of the inner node length, it tells a very different story. And that's usually what you're seeing. It's very long, leggy. And then the leaves also get smaller, right? So on a plant that's light starved, new growth will be much smaller. So the leaves will tend to be smaller, right? Obviously, because there is less, the plant can make less food. There's less energy to go around. So it can't grow leaves that are as big. So that's another thing to look for. Yeah, Rafi, my Raffidophora tetrasperma, I feel like has been such a teacher for me with internodes and light because he's moved. He's one of my lone survivors of my three moves, you know, in the last couple of years. And if I look at his stem... I can see which apartment those things were grown in. So he had pretty good internodes in my first apartment. Then we moved him to a very dark home. The internodes got so much longer and also the stem got thinner. Then we put him under a grow light. The stem got thicker. The internodes got shorter. Now he's in a Western facing window. He's growing like gangbusters. But it is interesting. You can like track his stem is like the story of his light exposure, which I think is kind of funny. I have this really, (laughs) this poor Echinopsis, this cactus that I bought, oh gosh, probably seven or eight years ago. And they're the ones, to give you a very basic description, they look like a little spiky ball and they've got big white flowers that come out on them. So you buy as a little ball and they flower. Of course, they grow up into a much taller columnar cactus, but this... (laughs) This sacrificial experimental plant of mine has gone like with your graphy from areas of highlight to low light, to highlight to low light. And I'm creating this wave pattern in the growth habit <laughs> where the trunk is like fat when it's been under highlight, under the grow lights. And then when the grow lights get turned off or it gets moved, the trunk gets skinnier. And then I move it back <laughs> to highlight. So there's this whole roadmap of light quantity, light intensity, and and DLI in this cactus, which is now about two feet tall, but it's wavy because it gets fat and then skinny and fat and skinny and fat and skinny. And so it's a perfect example of how your plant growth is limited under lower light conditions, both in intensity and overall light, your daily light integral. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that. I feel like that could be like a very cool high fancy like art installation of like all different cacti, like wavy cacti. I'll send you a photo of it. Okay. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So phytotoxicity also with phytotoxicity, I remember texting you a couple of years ago because I had Figaro my fiddly fig under a grow light and I had the grow light too close to it. And he had those dark spots, those phytotoxic spots from too much light. So be careful plant friends. So with the phytotoxicity, too much light can look like browning. They're like freckles almost that aren't edema, but like, right? How would you describe that? Well, scorching, you know, basically can start with like yellowing, sort of a bleaching out of the leaf. And then that tissue ends up dying. So you end up with sort of hard kind of brown spots of necrosis, dead tissue. It really looks like a burn, right? So you'll have some yellowing. The plant will begin to, at the top, where it's closest to the grow light, you'll start to see discoloration. You'll start to see yellowing. You may also, in a lot of species, succulents are a good example, you might start to see a lot of red and orange color happening. And in fact, I think there's been this trend of light stressing succulents to get them to be more colorful. And Hoya, yeah. That is an example of the plant essentially trying to produce more of those pigments, anthocyanins that act like a sunscreen, essentially, to sort of block the chlorophyll from getting as much of that light intensity, right? That's sort of a last-ditch effort to protect the plant 
from what will end up being the production of toxic free radicals when that plant exceeds its photosynthetic capacity. There's light compensation and saturation points that a species will hit. It can only use so much light before it can't use all of it anymore and it can't use all of the carbon dioxide and water. So it starts making these other free radicals, right? You know, we take antioxidants, right? We want to eat things with a lot of antioxidants. That's what's happening. Those oxidizing compounds get created in a plant when it's getting too much light and it can't use it all for photosynthesis. That's one of the reactions you'll see. So that's a sign to you that your plants, that the light intensity may be too strong. So back it away from the window, raise that grow light up a little bit, right? If it's you, a plant that's outside in the garden, you'll see the same exact thing happen. That plant can get light stress. Now, phytotoxicity can, we'll talk about that with lots of other things, but light is one of the things that can cause phytotoxicity. So you may look, it may just be burned brown. It'll start though with yellowing, or potentially oranges and reds, pigmentation starting to become much more strong. If you have a variegated plant, like, like say a croton, that color will get much more intense, but you can still scorch it. Like a ficus is a full sun tree, but the PPFD, the intensity of that light, if it's too close to the leaf, it can still burn it. And remember, grow lights do are not 100% efficient. They do generate heat. So sometimes that heat that is generated too close to the leaf surface does what? It increases evaporation through the leaf cells there, and then it also dries them out, compounding that problem. So there's lots of of things happening there. So you can have too much light, too much of a good thing, just like you can have too little light. And too little light is going to look like stunted growth or a slower, slower growing. Anything else that lower light is going to look like? Like you said, skinnier stems, smaller leaves, slow to stopping of growth, stretching, legginess, flopping over, wimpy. The technical term there is a wimpy plant. (laughs) It's a wimpy plant. It's a wimpy plant. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, low light. And you cannot make up for low light with more fertilizer. Cannot substitute fertilizer for light. It does not work that way. Sorry about it. So the biggest question that I think is probably the most asked question on the internet, overwatering versus underwatering, such a point of confusion for people. So can we talk about what overwatering looks like and what underwatering looks like and how what to look out for so you can intervene before it's too late? One important thing I want to say about this entire topic is that it's challenging because all symptomology can be very unreliable. So symptomology is, okay, we're observing what we see as symptoms of a problem, okay? All of the symptoms that we're going to talk about today can cross over from one cause to another. So lower highlight phototoxicity could look like phytotoxicity from, say, an herbicide damage or a fungal infection or underwatering and overwatering, which often have very similar symptoms. So it's very confusing, and I would just caution everybody that relying 100% on symptomology is just really not effectual. thing we need to do is observe the environment first, see what inputs the plant are getting, and then we kind of walk backwards using the symptoms to make the best guess of what we think is going on, right? That's what we're doing, and that's what most plant parents are going to do. So yes, overwatering and underwatering can be very challenging because the symptoms can mimic one another, right? So generally with both overwatering and underwatering, one of the common things you may see is leaves will begin to get yellow and drop, often from the bottom of the plant. This is something that you will see. Now between overwatering, you will generally have softer, mushier, wetter foliage coming off of that plant. With a plant that's been underwatered, you will generally have some browning and crispiness to the leaves. They will start to brown in a dry way, right? And potentially fall or yellow. So when you're overwatering a plant, you are essentially starving the roots of oxygen. The root hairs then begin to die off root hairs are what absorb most of your water and nutrients most efficiently. 
So once the plant starts to lose a significant surface area of root hair, it can't really absorb water. It also changes the structure of root tissue. So you you basically suffocate roots and then you start to have necrosis that sets in in the tissue. So overwatering, you can have wilting that happens in both overwatering and underwatering. Obviously, if you are confused as to which you think is happening, number one, are you in a low light situation? Number two, what is your watering regimen? Number three, let's look at your growing media. (laughs) How wet is your growing media? Does the pot have drainage? What is the likelihood that the growing media is simply staying too wet? Stick your finger in it. I recommend for beginners, especially to use a moisture meter. Once you have more experience and can better learn to intuit these things, you you won't necessarily need the moisture meter, but it's a great tool for beginners because you may not realize that the very bottom of that 10 inch tall pot is actually staying a lot wetter than you think it is. But by putting the moisture meter down there, it can tell you whether it's dry or wet. So if you're really not sure, the best thing you can do is slide that plant out of the pot. If that plant has a relatively small root system, a lot of the soil starts to fall away. The roots are getting kind of mushy and brown. You're overwatering. That's too much water. If that root ball is still relatively intact, you still have a pretty good looking root system. Maybe it's pretty sizable, but the growing media around that root ball is dry. Then clearly the plant's not getting enough water. It's drying out too quickly. It may need more frequent waterings. It might need a slightly larger pot. Conversely, plants that get overwatered may need a smaller container and that solves the problem. So container size can also be part of the problem when it comes to water management. So you have to look at all of the environmental conditions, check your own habits, and then are you dealing with with wet and mushy or are you dealing with crispy and dry? (laughs) <laughs> That's like a, just a really, really simplistic way. Wilting with sort of soft kind of water soaked looking foliage is generally going to be more of an overwatering situation. Wilting or leaf drop with sort of yellow to crispy edges, underwatering. Another thing that can happen, Pilea peperomioides. This is a great example. I get tons of pictures of folks with their coin plant, Pilea peperomioides that looks a little bit yellow and you see little dark dots all over the leaves. That is typically a sign of overwatering in that species. You get areas of necrosis. It's little spots of tissue in the leaf that start to die because the plant's waterlogged. You can't, it's the roots are getting suffocated. And so nine times out of 10, when I tell people, hey, I think your plant is number one, getting too much light because of the yellowing that I'm seeing in it and what I know about that species, And the little black dots and some of the drooping that I'm seeing on your plant, you're watering it too often. Back it away, a foot away from that south-facing window and don't water it for a few weeks. And it always turns it around for that plant. Pilea is an interesting, because a symptom I feel like people see a lot is the bottom leaves falling off. Yes. And I think Pilea is a common one where those bottom leaves, the older leaves will kind of yellow or brown and fall off. Philly figs are another one. What is leaf drop normally a symptom of? Well, it can be a symptom of many different things. Okay. It can be a symptom of water mismanagement, either too much or too little. It can be a symptom of nitrogen deficiency or deficiencies in some of your macronutrients that are highly mobile. So a plant that's nitrogen deficient might cannibalize nitrogen from the older lower leaves and move it up to new growth. And so those lower leaves will die and drop off. Okay. It could be um, natural shade response. So as a plant grows and the canopy expands and the leaves at the top of the plant are the ones getting the light and the leaves at the bottom are not, they no longer are contributing photosynthetically as well to that plant. So it's going to drop those leaves. So some lower leaf drop is simply a factor of natural maturation Many plants are just going to naturally lose lower leaves as they get shaded out by the upper canopy over time. Of course, if you were providing more light at the lower part of the plant, it may not drop as many leaves. So some of that is 
physical access to light levels and the natural maturation of that plant. With pilea, a lot of people will send me, like you say, you know, tall plants with a lot of leaves at the bottom. What's wrong with my plant? I'd say, well, that's what it looks like when it gets older. Yeah. It's not going to stay in this little bushy ball. It's going to mature. And eventually you're going to lose some of those lower leaves over time, especially plants that become woody or semi-woody. Yeah. That's what happened with my fiddly fig. Billy bought it for me as like a stem tip cutting and the leaves were very small. And then I put it under my Soltech light and I kid you not the leaves, like because it was getting the light that it needed, like tripled in size. And so I had the little baby leaves on the bottom of the plant and then the leaf, the top of the plant that was growing just was like larger and larger, like beautiful, real fiddle leaf leaves. And so those little baby leaves did eventually fall off because they weren't getting that grow light anymore because they were like directly under the large leaves. It was like an umbrella almost. Right. And that's normal. So if you look at trees, you know, if you look at many tropical plants, you know, out in, in nature, eventually they're going to develop what I call naked knees. Naked knees. I love that. <laughs> Naked knees, you know, and and like I said, growing tomatoes in a, in a greenhouse, for example, you know, vertical vegetables, you know, you see those pictures of indeterminate tomatoes growing 20 feet up in a greenhouse. And one strategy to mitigate too much leaf loss at the lower part of the plant, right? You want to still have those leaves be photosynthesizing as, if you can, because we're going to produce fruit, right? That takes a lot of energy. You'll have vertical lighting further down the plant so that the lower canopy still gets adequate light. Interestingly enough, we've talked about this in some of my classes, so you may remember this, but different light spectrums penetrate through canopy differently. Green light can penetrate further down into the understory than blue or red light can. And so different colors of light can also influence plant morphology in regards to lower leaf retention or loss. That's a whole nother topic, but I'm just throwing that out there because it's factually, it's one of the things that changes what your plant looks like in terms of where it's growing leaves and where it isn't. Yeah. What about nutrient deficiency? Because I think that when I was in your classes, that kind of blew my mind, the nutrient deficiency and how people can misinterpret nitrogen deficiency for an over underwatering moment. What do we need to know? What should we be looking for as signs of nutrient deficiency, both with houseplants and garden plants? Well, I'm going to tell you this one is is pretty tough. Again, because it's very easy to conflate another problem for a nutrient deficiency or vice versa. A watering issue, you know, with a nitrogen deficiency, it's it's very easy to assume it's one thing but it's really another. So don't beat yourself up if this isn't something that's easy because it can take a lot of observation and analysis from somebody who has worked with plants for many years to figure out exactly what's going on. So it's complicated and plant nutrition is very complicated. And I hesitate to even really give you hard lines on what to look for for certain nutrient deficiencies. Again, because symptoms can vary for different nutrient deficiencies on different species of plants often, right? And again, you know, it could be a nutrient deficiency or it could be a watering management issue. First off, what I like to say is that for the most part, most of your traditional house plants aren't terribly heavy feeders and usually aren't suffering from real nutrient deficiencies. Most of the time they're suffering from a light deficiency. Mm, okay. So I will say that a lot of heavy fertilizing of your indoor plants is typically not necessary. Okay. Foliage wise. When you start getting into flowering plants, obviously fertilizer applications become more beneficial because it takes a lot more energy to and nutrients to produce flowers and potentially fruit. But for most of your foliage plants, I would say I'm going to put my professional dollar on most of the problems being input related, light, right, and, and water management versus true nutrient deficiencies. That said, if you're providing all the light that that species needs to thrive, you've got your water management down, and you start to see something like the newer leaves are smaller and kind of stunted, but they're a little bit misshapen, and then lower leaves start to become yellow and fall off, but the plant is still growing 
that's often a signal of a nitrogen deficiency, a true nitrogen deficiency. The plant can yellow kind of overall, but it's usually the older growth that starts to yellow because that plant's going to cannibalize that nitrogen and move it up to new growth. Iron chlorosis is another one you might see, particularly in acid loving plants, because pH that's too high can inhibit nitrogen uptake for those species. So an, a true iron deficiency, you're going to see what we call intervenal chlorosis. So the veins remain green, but the space in between the veins gets yellow. And that's usually going to be on young leaves, newer growth. They can sort of turn up a yellow or white color. So that would be a situation where, okay, a chelated iron product would be something you would add to correct that problem. Magnesium, okay, lower leaves tend to turn kind of yellow from the outside of the leaf and that yellowing moves inward, but the veins can remain green. Manganese might have yellow spots or holes that sort of emerge in the leaf that you think, oh, this is a pest that's chewing my leaves, but it could technically be a manganese you know, deficiency. I mean, it's, but again, these are not 100% reliable symptomology and they could very well mimic something else. So I would just caution that beyond sort of standard real nitrogen deficiencies or iron deficiencies, it's tough to really get on point with that with home diagnosis of houseplants. Now, if you are growing flowering plants, orchids are a great example because orchids would be a group of plants that I would give you a regular fertilizer regimen for. If you are providing adequate light for that species and you've got the water and humidity down and the flowering is kind of puny, or maybe the flowers are smaller than they should be, or you don't produce as many flowers, then that's a signal to you that that plant's probably not getting enough of the macronutrients it needs to really flower vigorously for you and produce really good flowers and fruits. Same goes for your edibles, right? So it really depends on what you're growing. (laughs) Every species has its own needs and requirements for light and use nutrients a little bit differently or require different pHs. So it's tough to get really, really specific here in an episode like this because it varies so much plant to plant and nutrient deficiencies very often mimic light, water, or disease issues. Okay. That was such a deep dive. And yeah, I feel like these cultural issues are big and they can send us as plant parents into Spirals. I wanted to hit you up with a couple of listener questions who submitted. We covered the watering stuff. How do I identify issues on plants that don't have green foliage, aka cystis discolor, but plants where if they have yellow or if they have pink, like how do you know what's the good yellow and what's the bad yellow or the good pink versus the bad pink? You know what I mean? Most of the time, because we're not going to get into pests and diseases in this episode but there's a whole nother topic of conversation we can have on that for these particular plants. But what I will remind your listeners of is that colored variegation, right, in plants like your cissus will become less intense under low light. So one of the first things I think to look for with a highly variegated plant is, am I losing foliage color? Does the plant look more green? Is the color less intense? Am I losing variegation pattern? is the leaf starting to look almost kind of a similar color across the leaf. That right there is a great indicator for you that that plant is not getting enough light or that the intensity of light isn't high enough for that species. You will get fading of variegation because you have less production of those colored pigments under light levels that are too low for that species. So normally the same recommendation is going to apply. You will get, you will still get lower leaves will start to become paler or will start to yellow and drop in situations of either over or underwatering or a nitrogen deficiency. That's still going to happen regardless of variegation. New leaves will be smaller, could be stunted or kind of rippled with a nitrogen deficiency, right? You will have intervenal chlorosis will still appear on variegated plants in our true iron deficiency. So many of the similar responses happen in those plants, but I think the first indicator is typically a loss of variegation color. 
but when you're talking about over or under watering, kind of all the same things apply. Your plant is going to wilt because it's lost turgidity. It's either lost turgidity because it's not getting enough water and too much of that water is leaving through evapotranspiration and not being replaced at the root zone, or it's wilting because it can no longer have tra- evaporation happening properly because there's too much water at the root zone and humidity levels aren't encouraging, right? Maybe they're high. And so the water's not moving up and out of the plant and you also have wilting in that situation. So the same recommendations apply to highly variegated plants. You just have to pay attention and watch for that variegation pattern to change and look for a leaf drop that would indicate over underwatering, mushy kind of soggy leaves or dry crispy leaves when you're talking about over underwatering. Okay, love it. What about, we had a listener write in saying that her fiddly fig leaves have holes in them. Her fiddly figs have holes in them. Well, that could be from any number of things. Oftentimes I find that necrosis, where you just have tissue loss, you have spots of tissue loss, something like a ficus, sometimes that can be from physical damage. Something bumped into that leaf, scratched it, you lose tissue, you get a hole there. Sometimes that's phytotoxicity from light intensity. If, say, you had that fiddly fig that was very close to a window that gets very hot, and maybe it had some scorching in some of those spots, that tissue dies, and then eventually it's going to fall away and you're left with a hole. It can happen from diseases, right? You can have necrosis and then holes, but usually that leaf is not going to survive and persist in those situations. And so if the rest of the leaf is seemingly healthy and you just have these weird holes in it, then you're likely looking at a situation where you had some phytotoxicity from maybe some light intensity that was too direct in that spot and you had necrosis. You could also have it from overwatering. So overwatering can cause, like we were talking about in the pilea, can cause areas of cells to die in the leaf tissue that spot dies out and that tissue falls away and you're left with a hole. So that could also be due to overwatering. It could be due to underwatering, (laughs) right? Right. (laughs) It depends. You can have areas of tissue that will die because they didn't get what they needed. They didn't get what they needed. And so you have necrotic spots appear, that tissue dries out, dies off. So without seeing the plant, without having pictures of it, without knowing anything about the environment or the placement of that plant, without knowing anything about the care habits, all anyone can do, I don't care how many degrees we have, is be a process of elimination, make the best guess. Yeah. Normally in this situation, I'll answer that question. And then all of a sudden I I get a whole new packet of information from that person. Oh, I did this, this, this. you know, I get an A, B, and C, and then I go, oh, well, if that's the case, then this is the problem, (laughs) you know? So usually what people need to do is harvest a lot more data about their environment and their care habits before anyone can really, truly tell them what's going on. Yeah. Okay. I love that. And that is classic Leslie Halleck go deeper and also empower yourself, figure it out, take a minute and do some research and get as much data as possible. I want to wrap I, I <laughs> completely opposite to what we all just, what we just spent so much time talking about, which is figuring out what the problem is, diagnosing it and fixing it. Leslie, when is it time to let it go and throw it in the compost? When is it time? How do you know that you're too far in and you can't bring the plant back from the dead. How much stress is it causing you to try to yeah. <laughs> you know, revive a plant? What is it worth to you? Look, there are certain situations, and we can get into this in another conversation, where a disease infection or a pest infestation really makes it impossible for you to keep that plant. Mm-hmm. If it's spreading something to you, the rest of your collection, then obviously you need to remove it. If there's little to no root system left on that plant, right? Because it's been too waterlogged due to either low light or a container without drainage or a container that's too big and holds too much moisture. And there's little to no root system left, or it's clearly got an infection at the root zone. It's time to get rid of that plant. So a lot of times the throwing out of the plant has a lot to do with something that's contagious 
okay? Or it has to do with the fact that there's simply not enough root system left on this plant to successfully revive it or make it worth your time to do so. Ultimately, what it comes down to is that what's it worth to you to try to spend the time to recover a plant? It also depends on the species. Knowing the resiliency of a species is important. What you can get away with on a species, like for example, your your raffi, right? Your raffidophora, raffidophora, however you want to say it, both ways are correct, is a semi-epiphytic vine that doesn't have to rely solely on a terrestrial root system. And you'd be amazed at how long I let all of those plants dry out and stay dry. If that plant dries out and loses a bunch of foliage, I know that it's not really hard to revive it ultimately long term, mm-hmm. or I can take cuttings off of it. Whereas an African violet that has succumbed to overwatering is probably not a likely candidate for saving because it grows from an individual crown. And once there's damage to that crown or that crown starts to rot, that plant itself is a lost cause. Take some leaf cuttings and start some new plants. So it also comes down to the species and what's its resiliency and Is it a cultural maintenance problem that can be corrected or is it a disease or pest problem that can't be corrected or it's not worth the risk of keeping it near the rest of your plant collection? And I think people don't cut their losses fast enough oftentimes when it comes to that. The great thing about growing plants is that you can just grow more. And if you've got a plant that's not making you happy, that's too hard to maintain, that looks terrible all the time because of your growing conditions, compost pile. I give you permission. I absolve your green guilt. Pitch it. Start over with your new knowledge and information or pick a different species of plant that's better suited to your environment and your habits. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's almost like a twofold answer. It's like, okay, how much stress does the plant have? Is the plant physically able to bounce back? And also how much stress is the plant giving you? Correct. And you got to weigh both of those sides. You know, talking with you is making me realize I've had this Burly Marks Sananth. I don't know how to pronounce that word, but I got it and I've hung on to it because it's an emotional plant. I got it at my first plant swap with Summerine Oaks and I got it as like a little cutting and I nurtured it into this very robust plant, but it really just has never loved living with me. I think it has not enjoyed my dry homes. I've had to resuscitate it a couple of times. And I looked at it the other day, you know, I was just gone for a couple of weeks. It did not like me leaving. And I looked at it the other day. It's not looking very happy. And I was like, I think I'm done saving you. Like, I think... Once a year, I have to save it because it's just not as hardy as the rest of my plants. And I think I'm done. I think I'm composting it. (laughs) Well, I'll say to that point, once the plant's no longer saving you, you maybe don't have any obligation to save it anymore. (laughs) I think so. It's not saving me anymore. And it's a high humidity plant. And high humidity divas cause a lot of heartbreak in this community. And the bottom line is, is that most of the time, I'm going to say, you got to go under glass. Yeah. For the high humidity diva, you got to go under glass so that you can control humidity. And for anybody out there who, you know, get a hygrometer, if they're really inexpensive, they will measure your temperature and relative humidity. It will teach you a lot about what you can and can't maintain in your space when it comes to humidity. So stop beating yourself up over the high humidity divas. If you can't go under glass and your house is at a relative humidity of 30%, you are fighting a losing battle. So stop stressing yourself out and grow plants that are tolerant of lower humidity levels. And then it's a happier experience for you and a happier experience for your plants. So when the plant is no longer bringing you joy, it's time to go. (laughs) Time to go, buddy. And I do have to say, that's a great point. I mean, investing in a hygrometer, which P.S. investing, it's like literally $8.99 on Amazon. They're so affordable. They're in my Amazon storefront. That was probably the most eye-opening experience I ever did. And I did it before I moved. And it was so interesting moving multiple times and seeing the different humidity environments in my house and how running humidifiers affected it or didn't affect it. Like I'm obsessed with my hygrometers. Like sometimes I will take them to different rooms that I'm in just because I'm curious, like even just the different rooms, what the humidity difference is. It's like using a quantum flux meter to actually measure the meaningful amounts 
quantity of, of light that your plants are getting. I remember going through your moves with you and I remember you being really hopeful with one of your moves. Oh my gosh, I have this big skylight and my monster is going to be oh so happy. And I was like, okay, let me, I was like, we're going to do this, but let me warn you that number one, that's not going to be enough light and your humidity is probably going to be too low. And once you started measuring those things, it was illuminating on multiple fronts. So work with the space you have work with the environment you have. And if the plant species doesn't match up to that and it's, and you no longer enjoy the struggle of creating an artificial environment that is suitable. If that process is fun for you and you like that challenge, go for it. If it's not fun for you anymore, what's the obligation there? Gift that plant to somebody who may have a better environment for it or pitch it in the compost pile. I give you permission. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's going in the compost pile. Done. Good for Thank you. you. You're Thank welcome. you for permission, Leslie. And you can DM us and let us know what else you've composted. Feeling inspired <laughs> at the end of this plant care episode. Leslie, you're the greatest. I can't wait to have you back for another episode. Frankie is freaking out because the morning doves have showed up. It's This is an afternoon recording. I don't know if you can hear Frankie, but he's he's calling to the doves on my balcony. I can hear him. He's so cute. He's so cute. Okay, where can people find you? And also, please go buy all of Leslie's books. If you're curious about growing under glass, you must buy tiny plants. Let us know all your books and where people can find you and potentially learn from you. Yeah, you can find me at my central hub of lesliehallock.com and you can just put up a link for that. You can also find me on Instagram at Leslie Hallock. You can find me on Facebook at Hallock Horticultural. Um, have a plant parenting group. My books are Gardening Under Lights. So if you want to learn all things about light science and growing indoors, both foliage and edibles, That's a good primer, a good starting place for you. If you want to dive into a lot of how to DIY propagation, plant parenting is a very photographically intense guide on all sorts of propagation. And then, yes, if you want to get into sort of the niche hobby of tinier plants, if you love high humidity plants, tiny plants is for you because I show you lots of ways to grow really really kind of difficult, tiny humidity divas under glass in a way that makes them probably some of the lowest maintenance plants that I have. It's there's it's really fun. And of course, if you're running out of space, but you want to keep growing your houseplant collection, tiny plants is a great way to go. If you don't have a lot of room to begin with, it's really a rewarding way to keep plants. And so I introduce you to lots of species that you may have never heard of in tiny plants. So yeah. I have multiple copies of all of Leslie's books, so I can't recommend them enough. We'll link to them in the show notes. Leslie, this was so nice having you back on. I missed you. I love you, friend. I can't wait to have you back on again soon. Thank you so much, Leslie. All of her social media handles and books are linked in the show notes. She's the best. I can't wait to have her on for another episode of Grow Better Soon. I think we're going to talk about common plant pests. I also want to talk to her about plant diseases. If you have an idea for an episode with Leslie, let me know. I think you've heard my baby bird Frankie, my baby budgie chirping in the background today of the intro and outro and maybe my interview with Leslie. Let me know if you like hearing him or not. Frankie has hands down been like the best thing I've ever done for myself and my mental health and my joy. But putting a baby bird in my office when I'm a podcaster has been interesting because now I have little birdie tweets in the background. So let me know if they're too distracting. But please go to my Instagram at Growing Joy with Maria to see all the birdie videos of Frankie, my baby budgie. He's the light of my life. It's been so fun caring for him. And also it's been an interesting reconnection with nature. Like I've connected with nature through my plant collection and through my garden, but I've also connected with nature through having a baby bird because he is nature, just like I am nature. And it's the sweetest little friendship. And sometimes he sits on my shoulder. Anyway, enough talking about your bird, Maria. Until next time, I hope this episode was helpful. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? 
Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast.